Okay, we're ready. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Spokane City Council legislative meeting this evening. Will you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Bingle? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Zapone? Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right. We don't have any poetry at the podium uh, tonight, but guests, you can supply some during your testimony if you like. <laughs> And uh, we do have one proclamation, Deaf Awareness Week. Councilmember Bingle is going to read that, and I believe we have Sandra Carr from the Washington Advocates for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Councilmember Bingle. Yes, I don't think Sandra is here tonight, but I'm going to uh, read this. Uh, so, whereas Deaf Awareness Week was first celebrated by the World Federation of the Deaf, WFD, in 1958, and whereas the event is also known as the International Week of the Deaf, its purpose is to acknowledge American Sign Language, ASL, as the primary communication mode for the deaf and hard of hearing communities. It's important to emphasize the full communication access for all settings so all the deaf and hard of hearing communities are part of society and not marginalized. And whereas Deaf Awareness Week is the third week of September, this is an opportunity for children and adults in Spokane, Washington to learn about programs, services, education, and self-advocacy available to them through the Washington Advocacy of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim September 12th through the 16th, 2022, as Deaf Awareness Week in Spokane and acknowledge ASL as the primary communication mode for the deaf and hard of hearing communities and encourage children and adults in Spokane to learn about the resources available to them through the Washington advocacy of the deaf and hard of hearing. All right, and again, I don't think she's here, but let's give a round of applause for the proclamation. <laughs> All right, well, I'll just have, um, Ms. Fister, read the consent agenda in a moment, but for those of you who are here and going to testify, just wanted to go over the rules briefly. We allow up to three minutes of testimony on any issue that you signed up for before 6 p.m., and we have a little timer here with a light that will turn yellow when you have one minute left and then red when your time is up, and I'll ask you to uh, finish at that point. Um, please address your comments to myself chairing the meeting. Uh, refrain from any... Uh, personal negative comments about individuals. Um, please don't uh, get overly loud or pound the table, the podium. Uh, we don't allow signs. And a little contrary to what we just did, we don't do applause or boo for testimony. So everyone has a safe space to express their opinions um, without people commenting on them audibly and disturbing the piece. Um, and with that, Ms. Fister, if you could read the consent agenda. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, five-year value blanket order with or Oxart Inc. Spokane for liquid chlorine for the water department. Estimated annual expenditure, $150,000 plus tax as needed. Number two, public works agreement between the city of Spokane and YOY Incorporated doing business at Veritas, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho for removal and replacement of the Garden Park Reservoir pump house roof from October 1, 2022 through September 30, 2023, $88,484 including tax. Number three, contract amendment with Craig Trubrod and k l Gates, LLP, Seattle, Washington, to act as outside special counsel to provide legal advice and counsel regarding environmental matters for the Waste Management Department, additional $40,000. Total contract amount, $193,000. Number four, multiple family housing property tax exemption conditional agreements with A, 51-09036 LLC for the future construction of approximately 167 units at parcel numbers 35184.0502.0503. 0 0.0504, commonly known as 711 and 17 West Spokane Falls Boulevard. B. Sigatov, Andre, Leah, Sigatov, Mikal, and Ludamia for the future construction of approximately four new units at parcel number 35162.220, commonly 08, commonly known as 5025 East Smith Avenue. C. 1727 East Hartson, LLC for the future construction of approximately 28 units at parcel number. 
35212.2010, commonly known as 1727 East Hartson Avenue. D, Idaho LLC for the future construction of approximately nine units at parcel number 25131.5106, commonly known as 1801 West Mellon Avenue. E, Howard Partners LLC and Jerry's Trees and Nursery Incorporated for the future construction of approximately eight units at parcel number 35184.1904, commonly known as 220 North Howard Street. F, Brakeley Investments LLC for the future construction of approximately nine units at parcel number 25131.5401, commonly known as 2001 West Bloon Avenue. The conditional agreements will ultimately result in the issuance of a final certificate of tax exemption to be filed with the Spokane County Assessor's Office post-construction. Number five, report of the Mayor of Penny A claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through September 16, 2022. Total $10,767,473.85 with parks and library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding parks and library total $8,895,066.92. B, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through September 17, 2022, $8,669,703.30. Number six, City Council meeting minutes for September 8 and September 12, 2022. All right, we have one member of the public who has requested to testify, and that would be Amber Durkoop. Is Amber here? Here she comes. Come on down, Amber. You can come down to the podium. Amber Dirkoop. Right, right in the middle there. Great. Never really done this before. Okay. Um, am I first? You are, and I don't know if you heard me say you'll have up to three minutes. This will turn yellow when there's one minute left and then red when your time is up. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. Okay. So I'm just. What were you here to testify about? It is about the um, quality in. The okay, that wouldn't be for this what? time. Oh, I'm over here. Okay. Okay, you're at the end of the meeting in open form. Great. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, all right. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda as read, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Any abstentions? Consent agenda is adopted. That brings us to our first special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36193, amending ordinance number C36161, passed by the City Council of December 13, 2021, and entitled, an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in, forfeitures and contributions funds, Fund number one, increase appropriations by $175,000. A of the increased appropriations, $40,000 of the increase is to be used as confidential funds used for controlled purchases of illegal substances. B, $125,000 shall be used to fund a request for proposal to nonprofit entities that provide at risk youth services that will support prevention of drug use and drug crimes using peer support and leadership for individuals who have successfully exited criminal justice involvement. C, $10,000 for training. Two, the increased appropriation is funded from unappropriated reserves in the forfeitures and contributions fund. This action arises from the need to continue and expand the use of confidential funds. Deferred from September 12, 2022 agenda. All right, we have some testimony on that. And just to kick off the discussion, uh, this is a special budget ordinance, so it takes five votes to pass. It was originally proposed um, by the administration uh, this spring um, because they needed $40,000 more for um, confidential funds for con buying uh, drugs and giving to confidential informants. Uh, and there's 10,000 for training and they originally asked for $25,000 for uh, to a nonprofit for at-risk youth services. Uh, council, I don't know if it was in May or June, amended it to add $100,000 to the youth side of it because there was sufficient reserves in the fund for that. And now we're here for a vote on that. And we have the first person up is Jennifer Hicks. And after Jennifer Hicks <laughs> is Kim Schmidt and then Tracy Bloom. Uh, thank you, Council President Beggs and Spokane City Council. It's great to see you tonight. Um, you probably know the statistics. They're horrible. 
186% uh, increase in fentanyl overdoses from 20 to 21 in Spokane County. And the federal government just named Spokane one of 11 crisis areas for fentanyl deaths in the United States. This is terrible. This is horrible. And I and many of my friends are not feeling safe in our community. And I'm really, I am against um, the city council reappropriating the Spokane Police Department's funding. Forfeiture, forfeiture of property net proceeds are required to be remitted to, um, to the state and they're to be retained by the seizing law enforcement agency exclusively for the expansion and improvement of controlled substances. I trust our law enforcement to spend the money in the appropriate manner. And I don't approve of the city council making decisions for Spokane Police Department on this money. I just learned that this is the only city that's trying to do this to our police department, uh, to a police department. It is their funds, and they should have the, uh, the ability to spend it in the way that they find appropriate. And I know that they have our best interests at heart, and they are trying to keep us safe. And I'm very upset with the way that our city is going downhill. And it is in large part because of the actions of some of the people on the city council. I am very disappointed in your decision to defund the police. And this is a smoke and mirrors way to do that. There is other money that can be found for youth drug rehab, and I'm for that. You can use ARPA money. We know there's money there. You can get grants. But people are more than statistics. People are dying in our streets. Families are being devastated by the loss of their children and their loved ones because of drugs. We need to stop this scourge that's happening in our city. And I beg you to please let the police department do their job. Let them have control over their funds that is rightfully theirs. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Jennifer. Um, Kim Schmidt, then Tracy Bloom, and then Mayor Woodward. Hi, Kim Schmidt from the Valley. So I'm going to start tonight with a brief qualifier. In 2008, a judge gave me two options. I could either go to jail or I could go to treatment. I chose treatment. I've now been sober for 14 years. I spent eight of those 14 years working as a licensed drug and alcohol counselor at a well-respected program in California. Since getting sober, I have also maintained a connection to a 12-step community. As a counselor, I worked with clients both one-on-one -on -one and in group settings. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm my voice is a little bit gone today. One thing that is very clear through my work in the field and in my own personal experience is that cutting off supply does not lead to stop or reduced use. I make this statement aimed at the $40,000 to be used for drug buys and confidential informants. I listened to the meetings before the meeting and I, couldn't, I can't help but feel that the rep representatives from the Spokane Police who have spoken on the matter feel that the two issues one being getting off drugs or getting drugs off the street through buys and CI payments and the user getting sober are correlated. They're not correlated. I can assure you that those who are active in their addiction are flexible, highly motivated and unwavering in their dedication to obtain the substance that their body requires. In fact, many will switch substances, pay more, find a new dealer, engage in extremely risky, often illegal behavior just so they can feel better. Um, those caught up in addictive behaviors will go to great lengths to secure their supply. I have a friend who you would never know now, but she literally ran her car full speed into a brick wall because her doctor stopped giving her pills. She needed her pills. I see minimum advantage to spending taxpayer money to buy drugs. I do feel that it is important to know what substances are on the street so that first responders can adjust accordingly so that they can have supplies of Narcan and they, they can be able to protect themselves from something like dermal fentanyl exposure. I am by no means suggesting that we foster a lawless society of addicts and alcoholics. After all, actions do have consequences, but when we rely on the legal system to manage those deep in their addiction, it's often too late. We must look at the person behind the addiction to make any impactful change. 
The disease of addiction is multi-pronged. It's biological, psychological, and environmental. There's a lot of moving parts to it. I would like to see more money being spent on primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention me methods. High importance should be placed on education. This includes doctors. A large majority of those, in the of those dependent on substances are introduced to the substances through their healthcare providers. People need to know things like the fentanyl that's been floating around that folks like the sheriff has been posting pictures of have the same markings as pharmacy grade oxycodone. Just as mental health professionals have already been proven effective when dispatched to certain police calls, it would be effective for substance use professionals to accompany Kim. police on certain calls. Also proven effective in other areas, outreach that's teams that can connect and assess and help time, those Kim. who are ready to seek treatment. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Tracy, <coughs> and after Tracy is Mayor Woodward and Chief Meidel. <coughs> my, my name's Tracy Blum. That's oh. uh, my father's last name. Um, I lost him at, um, because of um, drinking and driving um, in Seattle, Washington. I also lost my mother, my, by, or my dad by 42, my mother by 52. Um, because of staph infection. I came to Spokane, Washington when I was 16, and um, I'm now 52. I started raising my children here, now grandchildren, and I am proud of that. And um, I'm proud to also be clean and sober today because I went to Spark for my 52nd birthday, you know, so I can show my kids a different way of life. Um, you know, uh, code enforcement, uh, Pier 1 Spokane, Six and Cannon Shelter, and these other hater groups um, I'm having issues with. Uh, they keep getting me mixed up with other Tracys. And unfortunately, we all need safe housing. Um, and uh, you know, that's all I have to say about that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Woodward, come on down. And then after mayor is Chief Meidel and then Sherry Barnett. Thank you, Council President Beggs and council members. Um, I am here in support of our incredible Spokane Police Department and our police chief. Specifically, I'm here to support Chief Meidel's ability to decide how to best use forfeiture funds for his own department. I oppose this ordinance because it conflicts with guidance that we've received and it expands the permissible expenses that forfeiture funds can be used for. I also oppose this ordinance because this is a decision our police chief should be making not city council. No other police chief in the state of Washington must get permission from his or her own city council on how to spend these funds. Several months ago, Chief Meidel requested $40,000 in forfeiture funds for controlled <laughs> drug buys to get illegal drugs off the street. It is a tool that is widely used to fight the influx of illicit drugs and go after drug dealers. That's several months of proactive work our officers could have focused on to make our city safer. I know you're all aware of the fentanyl crisis that Spokane, like so many other cities in this country, are facing. It's the deadliest challenge our country is facing. It has killed more than 100,000 people last year. It's the leading killer of Americans 18 to 45 years old. Last year, Spokane County saw a 185% increase in fentanyl-related overdoses. And just last week, a new and especially frightening headline for parents everywhere. Drug cartels are now targeting children and young adults with rainbow fentanyl made to look just like candy. Spokane is a regional narcotics distribution hub because of its proximity to Canada and to Interstate 90, which is used to move drugs to eastern states. This ordinance would spend $120,000 of the police department's forfeiture funds for youth drug prevention programs. Youth drug prevention programs are a great idea, no argument here. We need to do more to work upstream to educate children about the dangers of drugs, but this should not come at the expense of SPD's drug enforcement activities. And if you continue to delay SPD's ability to access their forfeiture funds, more illicit drugs will find their way onto our streets. You Council allocated $3 million from ARPA for youth behavioral programs. That's a lot of money. You can use that money. Don't deplete SPD's forfeiture funds with this ordinance, and please, I ask you, 
Let our police chief do the job he was hired to do, to lead his department, to make the decisions that keep our community safe without the constant microscopic oversight of the city council. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Woodward. Chief Meadow. Good evening, Council President, members of the Council, Craig Meidel, Chief of Police for the Spokane Police Department. Thank you for giving me a few minutes. Um, I'm told one thing to never do publicly is do math. I'm going to violate that rule real quick, so I'm <laughs> going to be happy to go back and uh, go over those details with you. Uh, but this whole process, asking for this $40,000, started back on April 25th. Originally, SPD had asked for $120,000 this year for drug investigations. We were given $80,000 out of that $120,000. So we went back knowing we would need that money to continue our drug investigations on April 25th. The current balance of state drug forfeiture funds after 2022 allocations and uh, SBOs approved by the council is currently $481,000. So if we spend $125,000 on youth intervention programs, $120,000 every year on drug investigations, which we've spent over the last two years, $10,000 on training and travel, which is a typical request every year, and then $120,000 on undercover cars, uh, that, that is a total of $375,000 a year. When you subtract $375,000 a year from 481, that leaves $106,000 in this fund. To date, we have $90,000 sitting on property from forfeiture money. So if you add that $90,000 to what will be left next year, if we go down this road, we will have $196,000 for all of these items in uh, 2024. So when you're looking at over a third of a million commitment, if we go down this road, we will only have $196,000 uh, starting in 2024. Uh, our drug commander pointed out at the Public Safety Committee meeting that our, our seizures are going down. Uh, we believe based on the Blake decision. Um, so we don't believe that we're going to have funding coming in at, at the same level that it has come in in prior years. And then I want to reiterate what the mayor said as well. We are 100% supportive of, of education. We think it's a two-pronged approach. We need to go after the dealers that are bringing these toxins into our city right now and get them off the street. And then we also need to educate, especially our youth, before they go down this road so that they never take that first hit, that first smoke, or that first injection. And I, I know the mayor has committed to working with the council on finding other funding sources as well. And just to reiterate what um, some of the numbers show as well, in Spokane County, from 2014 to 2020, we had a 600% increase in overdose deaths. Last year, according to the medical examiner's report, if all overdose deaths combined, 285% increase in 2021 versus 2020. Washington had almost three times the drug overdose rate as the rest of the nation last year, and this is according to the CDC. And then we all know the figure of over 105,000 people died in one year, according to the CDC, due to drug overdoses. It's almost twice as many as died in the Vietnam War. And here we are still talking about the Vietnam War after all of this time in one year, we lost more than we did during all of the Vietnam War. That's in one year due to drug overdosis. We support the intervention. We're just asking this, this is the money we have that we absolutely need to continue that enforcement part as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Council President, can I ask a question of the Chief? Sure. Chief, if barring any changes uh, as presented, would you prefer that Council passes as, as it is or, or not? Um, so the 40,000 with uh, the 125,000 for youth intervention, yeah. uh, do not pass. Okay. I, I have to have money in here at some point to continue these drug investigations. And I know what we're looking like overall going into 2023 and uh, things aren't looking good for next year as well. So I need this funding, which is perfectly aligned for drug enforcement for drug enforcement. Thank you. But Chief, just, I, just, I just want to be crystal clear. So you would prefer that we not give you the 40,000 that you asked for? if it comes along with the money for youth? Um, that, is, that is correct. That is, okay. And do you have money in your account for the, to finish the year without the 40,000 that you requested? Because that's why you requested it before. Um, we do not. So what would you do for your confidential informant and drug buying? Uh, we'll either have to come and find other money from the general fund or we'll have to stop drug investigations. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, Sherry Barnett. This is one bad thing I haven't personally done. Oh, council president and all members of the city council. 
But I belong to a church that is very heavily recovering dope addicts and alcoholics. And it wasn't very long ago that we all, even I wrote a letter and many, many people, we got as many people as we could to write letters asking the party in majority not to pass that legalizing heroin and meth and all these things in certain amounts, magic mushrooms, these things are killing young people because young people now do not have values. They no longer think about the Ten Commandments. They no longer have a strong family ties. And without hardly, I've never heard an exception to it, the people that speak of having come to their senses thank the law enforcement. They thank the city jail, they thank the penitentiary because they sat there and they got their brain clear and they got dried out enough that they could make a change in their life. So I urge you to quit taking power into your hands and give the power to the people that are able to save their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, that's the end of public comment. Uh, any council commentary? Council Member Kinnear. I, just a quick question because in reference to something that Chief Meidel said, under F of the current um, ordinance, it states the city's top priorities for spending state authorized funds in 2022 and 23 are as follows. The city will annually fund these two priorities equally from state funds and will not expand additional state forfeiture funds if it would reduce the reserve of state forfeiture funds below 250,000. So it sounded like when you were doing the math on up here that adding those all up, it would not be 250,000. Therefore, we, I'm just clarifying. Uh, therefore, um, we would not be able to spend the money on youth programs because he wouldn't have enough in his reserve. Yeah, you are a little bit getting ahead of yourself because that's another ordinance, not this spending ordinance, but yeah, essentially. Okay, but I was responding to, yeah. I just wanted to clear that up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, you know, we had a robust debate during our briefing session. So for those who maybe didn't see that, you can go back and, and view that. Um, but really, you know, I think the argument that, that I was making, and I'll just reiterate here very quickly, is, and the chief put it better um, than any of us can, and that's simply that um, these dollars are, are really important uh, for the chief and his department to be able to do the enforcement that they do with the CI um, uh, drug buys and whatnot. And it's obviously getting very difficult for them with the Blake decision. There's a lot of unknowns uh, in terms of what the future of that uh, law that the legislature replaced the Blake decision with is gonna be. It sunsets uh, next summer. And so the legislature could uh, you know, create something that's worse, better. There's an initiative that's being, signatures are being collected on right now that would completely legalize drugs is my understanding. And so there's, there's a lot of just variables out there. Um, and the chief just said, you know, when you add up the dollars, there's just not enough to fund what they know they need to fund in the coming year. Uh, and so, you know, he's our industry expert. He's the one that's, that's charged with sort of guarding this account. And the ordinances that are in place today, um, as of this, this moment that we're speaking, you know, essentially say that, that the chief needs to put forward the ideas that we consider. And, you know, everybody in this room watching on, on City Cable 5 heard the chief say, that, and that's how important this is, you know, he would vote no on this or would advocate a no vote if it meant that it would potentially drain the, the coffers of this fund. Um, you know, I've, I'm somebody who has sort of a love-hate relationship with civil asset forfeiture. I think there's um, a lot of good it can do because obviously it provides us an opportunity to seize assets from, put, you know, bad people out there and, and hopefully interrupt their, their operations. Um, but at the same time, a lot of times we seize assets, you know, before, uh, this is the, the broad we, not city of Spokane, but the broad we, uh, we seize assets, you know, before there's a conviction, before we know that somebody is in fact guilty of, of whatever it is they're accused of. And, and that, that has always rubbed me the wrong way. So 
I have a love-hate relationship with it, but the fact is, the, the way it is, is what it is right now. And the money is there, and, the, and it's pretty clear to me who is supposed to make the decisions with regards to how those dollars are spent. It's the chief. Um, I trust Chief Meidel. I trust his judgment on this. And so I will uh, vote accordingly and oppose as, as it is uh, drafted. Councilmember Bingle. Thank you, sir. Um, so quick point of clarification on this, on, on F. Um, it says the city will annually fund these two priorities equally from state funds and will not expend additional state forfeiture funds if it would reduce the reserve state of forfeiture funds below $250,000. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't, this doesn't say that we wouldn't stop funding at-risk youth drug prevention programming if we got down to $250,000. It just says that we won't drain that account less than $250,000, which effectively gives it a zero balance at $250,000. And so, we actually would run out of money sooner if we, if we had to stop it at $250,000 because it doesn't prioritize one of these over the other. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's um, how I'm reading it so far as that. The way, the way I'm understanding it is you could spend up to the $250,000 if there's those, if you spend it on those two priorities. Right. But you couldn't spend it on some other thing that's a lower <coughs> priority to the department. Um, if it goes below 250. But we wouldn't stop um, spending on at-risk drug youth uh, prevention programming at $250,000 so that we can continue to keep spe uh, spending on CIs though, correct? Those two things would have to keep getting spent at the same time. That's how it's currently written. Right, right. And so again, the, the trouble is, is that when it, when it comes to um, the amount of money that we're spending on it, what ends up happening is um, you know, as we're talking about, you know, we have we have purchased undercover vehicles here. Uh, we have uh, drug buys that are happening out of this. And then, if we're also spending that same exact amount, dollar for dollar, if we do $120,000 for undercover vehicles, if we do $120,000 for CI informants, then that to me says that we have to spend $240,000 on on youth drug pro no, programming. No, the, what the youth drug programming is tied just to the. Um, confidential informant drug buys. Okay. So it's not tied to other things. Gotcha. So on the CIs, if we're going to be spending 120, then we're still spending 120 on the youth uh, programming. The, the thing in, in question here isn't should we spend on youth drug prevention programming. Again, every single person acknowledges why that's important because we do need to swim upstream. And we're talking about how dangerous this is for children uh, because we have read those articles, the, the terrifying articles that children in middle schools and in grade schools are being exposed to fentanyl because it looks like Skittles. I mean, that's terrifying stuff for any parent or grandparent or any uh, you know community um, participant. I mean, that's terrifying stuff. And so we need to be able to identify uh, uh, the drug dealers um, and, and being able to stop their activities um, as best we can. And we also need to fund uh, the youth drug prevention programming to help children understand, by the way, don't take this. If you don't know what it is, don't take it. That's equally important. The thing at hand though is where do we, where do we fund it from? And unfortunately this, this account will get drained quickly um, if this is something that we're committing to. One of the other things that makes this tough is um, one of the reasons why we don't want to commit to too much future spending with this is because that becomes the obvious legal problem is that what we don't want to have happen is that um, the community believes that officers are seizing property because we've committed to too much uh, spending in the future. That's one of the reasons why we can't commit to future s expenditures with this money is because we don't want it to look as if we're seizing property to fund um, to fund liabilities. And so for me, I think these are both good things. It's just that this fund is not the right fund. Councilman Cathcart and I have uh, proposed several amendments to strike through, uh, to, to propose different uh, funding sources for this because it is important to do. Um, but currently in this state right here, uh, even though uh, I'm a sponsor of this um, of this ordinance. I will be um, opposing it as is because this is just not the right funny. Uh, excuse me, the, not the right fund to get the money from uh, for this particular action. And I hope that what ends up happening um, is tonight because it's an SBO. Um, I I hope that this fails just so that we can actually give the police the forty thousand dollars they need to continue their. Um, uh, their activities in the community. I hope they get the 10,000 for training. And then I hope we have a separate discussion to find money um, in the budget and in these different revenue sources that we've all talked about earlier to fund these programs substantially because there is, there is great value in it. But 
as it is right now, I won't be supporting. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. So, thank you, Mayor and Chief. First of all, I think I want to start with people think we are defunding the police because we didn't vote for this, and that is absolutely not true. Everything that has come before this council requested by police, we've just about funded. So, whether this vote goes yes or no, that's not about defunding the police. It is about where the money comes from, and it's about accountability. So we talk a lot about accountability for everybody. And I have just asked the police department, tell us some outcomes or data that this uh, confidential informant money has brought about, some success. Uh, we keep hearing how big the problem is, so I just need to understand that pouring 40,000 more dollars into this huge fund will garner us some outcomes that we are looking for. I need to know that when we invest in our young people that we will expect accountability from that also and how that will impact upstream. So they're not mutually exclusive, but I think the citizens really want to know, well, what comes of the confidential informant money? How much is, is, are we capped at 120? Or truly, do you need more? I, we don't know, because we haven't heard that type of dialogue um, from the chief going forward. So again, um, what's the accountability piece? Um, what's the deliverables are we expecting as we put more money into this confidential informant program? Not saying it's not needed, but what should we be expecting when we fund that uh, now and as we go forward? So I will be supporting because I think we need both. And Chief, I'm really sorry that you would rather not fund anything than to go down this road, but that's the decision uh, of your department of how we go forward. Councilmember Bingo. Well, I will say one of the things is that one of the reasons why this got deferred was so that we could have a discussion and then we ended up not having discussion on this. And um, I don't remember us once asking the chief to give us, uh, you know, metrics when it comes to uh, the CI buys. And I'm sure that if we would have asked for it, that we would have uh, heard something there. Um, and, and so for me, I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily about, you know, defunding the police, but I think there's, there's a lot in here that when we're talking about police, you know, we just amended something else that they asked us for where we're get, gonna give them, you know, half of what they need and then we're not gonna give them, uh, you know, the other half of what they've asked for. And so I don't necessarily think that it's that we don't give the police something, but I think the, the things that we ask of the police are things that we don't ask of many other departments, right? When it comes to, uh, you know, the, the fire engines from ARPA, you know, our like third week, on the job, we approved, you know, the fire engines after 15 minutes of discussion. Uh, you know, the police were tasked with a two year survey of, of studying the difference between gas vehicles and electric vehicles. And so it's not necessarily that we're saying, no, we're not gonna give you what you need. We certainly ask far more of our police to defend their, their expenditures than we ask of, of any other department in my opinion. And so it's not necessarily that we're defunding the police, but there is far more uh, far more hoops that, that we ask the police to go through to get um, what they believe um, is the best tool to get the job done. And so I think that's, a, that's an important distinction, but, but still. Council Member Zappone. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's frustrating to hear from the chief that he doesn't want us to fund it because we've been blamed for not funding this and holding this up when that's clearly not the case. We've been wanting to move it forward. And now we are being told to actually vote it down. And so I think that should be clear for the record that the recommendation from the police chief is to not support this and to not fund the police in their request for this. Um, I also find it frustrating that the mayor just made a recommendation that we should use ARPA funding from Youth Behavior Health. I've met with the mayor and asked her several times about what she thinks we should prioritize Youth Behavioral Health ARPA funding on. And just now was the first time I heard anything from you about that. And so I think that's very frustrating. I think our job on council is to look at the big picture and holistically. Um, the police do a great job and they're experts at what they do, but they don't see the whole picture. And so I think 
part of our job is to see that whole picture. And what we see is also that there are other ways that we can invest funding to decrease drug use in our community. We all agree it's a big problem. And I think we know that youth prevention programs are also beneficial. We also know that drug rates have gone up over time. So just using the forfeiture funds, how they've been used historically, is not going to stop drug use in our community. It's time for us to try new things. And so that is why I'm supporting this and supporting our funding to be used on youth behavioral health to try new things and to try to combat drug use in our community. I think it's, um, yeah. I think it's important to note the distinction between saying, no, I don't want this money to be able to do my job, and no, if we spend the money the way that you have told me to spend the money is going to, uh, in the chief of police's opinion, bankrupt a fund that keeps them from being able to fight their drug services. So I think there's a difference in saying, no, don't give us this money to fight drugs and don't give us this money for drugs while also saying that I have to spend this money on something that this money I don't believe is what it's intended for. And so I don't think it's fair to say that the chief is saying, no, let's not fight drugs because that's not what he's saying. Um, and so, yeah. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, just, just to piggyback, I mean, I, I interpreted the chief's words as, you know, we'll, uh, we'll just reset and live the fight again another day is really what I, what I heard. And, you know, he said it himself, we'll look for other, other aspects of funding, we'll come back in the next budget cycle. I mean, I, I just think he, he was pretty clear in, in his reasoning, and so he's not just willy-nilly saying, you know, vote this down even though I've been asking for it, he, he has some very legitimate concerns that he is, has shared. And furthermore, and I've said this before, he is the person who is in charge of making sure that this fund is uh, sustainable and, and is used for the proper things. And you know, he has, has asked us for very specific requests. Um, and again, we should just follow, follow what his request is, I believe, because you know, we can still fund the 125,000 or $100,000 for the youth at risk services through other means, could be ARPA, that was the proposal that I had brought forward earlier today, that didn't pass, but I mean, still, let's have that conversation, let's set that aside and, and allocate the 40,000 and have a real conversation around what the best source of funding is for that 125, move forward and, and implement a, a youth um, services program. I, I just wanna talk about this budget bankruptcy thing, because I just have seen no evidence of that. Um, uh, that's what it seems like the core argument that, oh my gosh, if you spend $240,000 a year from this fund um, as mandated by another ordinance, then you will bankrupt it. So right now, if we, if we pass this and give the chief the money he wants for um, additional uh, drug buying and confidential informant and some training money and fund the youth program that he uh, requested earlier but at a higher amount, we'll still have over $300,000 this year. This year's collections, just through, I think it's July or August, were the second highest ever. So this idea that Blake has changed the world, there just is no evidence. It's been two years since Blake. The last few years, the drug forfeiture funds have just been pouring in more than ever. So to, to imagine that it's suddenly going to be cut off without any evidence of that, that's, the, that's what I don't understand. The, if my, under, my recollection is that uh, the appeal period, if your money or uh, property is seized under the drug forfeiture laws, is about 60 days. So after 60 days, if you haven't filed an appeal on it, that means uh, the city is going to get their share of the money. And so it's, to say there's 90000 on the books, that's okay, that's 90000 that's definitely coming. That's not 90000 for the rest of the year or 90000 for all of next year. That's just what's in the, in the books right now. So we purposely changed this language uh, Councilmember Kinnear's request to say, hey, let's just do this through 2023 and see if there is money in the budget or not. That's, we, we changed that specifically today. Because if it turns out that there is this cliff that no one would be able to anticipate, but there is, and there's not enough money to do the confidential informants, then of course we'll change it. This is built on the premise that there is over, like I say, $300,000 in reserves after we make these expenditures. Uh, 481,000 right now. And the idea, as Council Members Opponent said, that we need to do more than just controlled drug buys because that is not slowing the rate. We've heard the crisis. We agree on the crisis. And we've heard from Captain Arleth and Matt Folsom, the police department's attorney, that spending money on these kind of youth programs is a proper purpose for forfeiture. 
and one that the police department has requested. The only dispute is the amount of money. That is the only dispute. And there's a, a remote fear that maybe somehow that will uh, get in the way of having enough $120,000 next year for um, that or 120,000 now. We're not gonna let that happen, but as long as we have excess in this fund and the ability to work with our youth and stop the demand before bad things happen, that's, that's where we're doing this. Um, so it just, the idea that we're gonna lose the money out of the budget on Blake or any other reason is not, even just Blake, just to be clear right now, any changes in it are not gonna get rid of felony drug uh, dealing that, that's going to be a, that's where the money comes from in this. It's not from drug possession. It is drug dealing. That, those are who have the money. It's not. So Blake doesn't really impact that that I've seen, and certainly not by the money we've gotten in the last two years. So it gets a little bit down to, uh, I guess, a little bit of a perceived power struggle. I'm sure the director of the streets department could tell us that he could spend the money better, yet we approved money for Strong Road. Streets Department didn't want that. They said that is not a good idea based on their data, based on their expertise. But as Council Members Opponent said, we're from a bigger, broader picture, and we think the community needs strong road to get fixed, even if the streets engineers don't like it. Same on the fire chief. We don't do everything that he wants. Every, and I'm pretty sure every city in the state, their council approves the money that's spending, because that's how we do it. The administration proposes, and then the city council adjusts and approves what they're going to do. That's what we do on everything. And there's nothing different about this. Our current law does limit the council to only purposes that the police chief has approved as a legitimate crime fighting. This purpose for youth has been approved by the chief and requested. It's only a matter of policy of how much on it. So that's why I, uh, brought the amendment before. I think we need to increase our spending, and it is exactly right in the four corners of the forfeiture um, purpose under state law and under practice uh, at the city. It's just recognizing that at this moment in time, we happen to have extra money, and at least four council members at one time or another have thought that it would best serve and would reduce the drug crime and overdoses more by spending a little more money on um, youth interventions and education. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I guess in, in some of the points you made could could absolutely be correct, but I would also just argue that the, the chief has has brought another perspective and he has some concerns, and so I would just ask. I mean, maybe it's rhetorical, but but what is the harm in considering an alternative source of funding for this, um, especially if we consider it as a one-time pilot that we would then look for other al alternatives for uh, you know future opportunities to continue it. But if there is potentially a risk that we would draw this fund down, or frankly, that, that you know, with this ordinance passes later, and that we're funding two, two of these items at equal amounts, and, um, and as you pointed out, that you know, we would absolutely not cut the CI uh, funding if there wasn't enough money. Why not just avoid all of that, and let's just look for an alternative source of funding so that we don't have any risks um, or, or any of those red flags? Well, I'll answer your rhetorical question. But so that either whatever we do, there's a risk. If we take the money out of ARPA, that's money that we need. The ARPA remaining funds have been requested by the mayor for many different things. And um, there's a lot of community needs out there. We have this money. We have extra money in the forfeiture fund at the moment. And so I see there's little risk because it's extra. We have funded every SBO for forfeiture money that the department has requested. We have funded. So this is not a case of us defunding something for this. It is not. We have given them everything that they have asked for. So I, I don't see it. Because we have excess money, we have money now, I believe we should set it aside. As Councilmember Kinnear said, we won't necessarily get the money spent any time in the near future because we have to do it, but we will at least have made a commitment of the money so that we can get nonprofits who would do it to actually bid on it. If it turns out in the next three or four months while we're going through that process that there's a cliff there, you know, we don't have to spend it. We don't have to go under contract. This is not allocating a contract. It's putting a stake in the ground and saying, youth education, drug prevention is super important to us. These are the funds that we actually have. And potentially, if we continue at the same rate that we've been the last two years, it will be a sustainable force, uh, a sustainable source of, of funding. So it's a risk. No matter, you know, we could game it out. There's either way. But this money is there, and uh, there seems to be quite a bit in the fund. So I don't, there's nothing that we're not spending on. 
uh, that we otherwise would at this time. And it gives us a foot in the door down that road. Councilmember Bingo. And I, I just think that there are several ways to put that to put that stake in the ground. I mean, we could do a resolution saying this is the policy of the city. These are things that we're pursuing. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's lots of ways that we could put that stake in the ground without pulling this uh, this money from this particular fund. And so, I again, I hear everything that you're saying. And again, a lot of what you're saying is good in this sense that yes, we need to be swimming upstream and we need to be telling children drugs are bad. Uh, a very good message that needs to be delivered. Um, again, the only dispute, as you say, is that it's coming from here, but that is the big dispute, right? That is the big question here. And so uh, why, while there might only be one dispute, it is, it is a, a big dispute. Any other commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. I'll just in with uh, our investment in our young people. Yes, it is a stake in the ground. It is a message, not only to uh, our young people, but to our community that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I will ask us and the chief, if not now, when? Because we've been asking. So please come with something or a partnership or a task force or anything, but that hasn't been presented to us as to how we go forward. So at this point, I'm willing to just, it's not spent, it's just set aside, it's not spent, just set aside as we pursue this as an investment in our young people. If not now, when? Council members of home. Yeah, I would just lastly say too that if the chief brought this forward to us in April, the administration agrees that this is important. They have not identified other funding sources until tonight, which is months later. So if they had genuinely tried to find other funding sources, they had multiple chances. The mayor could have listed it on an ARPA funding priority and never did. So I don't believe there's actually motivation to find other funding for it from the administration side. So I think we have to to what we've been talking about for months. Council Member Kinnear. I wanna be real careful about pointing fingers on what the administration does and doesn't do because I think that um, this, this hasn't been a priority for us. It's just kind of been pushed. And um, ARPA funding, although that's tantalizing because it's that free money stuff again, I hate that. Um, it's probably mostly spent. The, the chief did offer to spend 25,000 on youth programs. We upped it to 100. So really and truly, we're quibbling about $100,000 and where that money's gonna come from. And we're taking an awful lot of time to do it. And the administration's not opposing that 25,000. It's the amount and where it's coming from. So I don't know that we're ever gonna to come to an agreement, but we have that one year, because it's gonna sunset, we have that one year to figure out how we're gonna fund this in perpetuity, if it's important to us, if it actually makes a difference. So we have that one year to measure it, we have that one year to find a provider, and then we have that one year to find another source of funding. And I think that, that is important. So it's, it's not as if this is it, we're always gonna take money from this fund. It's got a sunset on it. And as council president said, there's money in that for at least a year. So let's try this. If it doesn't work, we do something else. But we're all committed mm -hmm. to making sure that our youth are protected and that they don't go down that road that we don't want them to go down. We're all committed to that. We're quibbling about $100,000 and where it's gonna come from. Not the 25 that the chief says he's willing to spend, but the 100,000 that extra that we want to spend. Councilmember Stratton. Hey, Lori got me worked up. I'm sorry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. A couple things. Um, I think it's important that everybody understand, and you probably know this um, if you watched our um, uh, briefing and um, our committee meeting today, but we all are taking this very, very seriously. We may disagree with each other, but I, I want to be very clear to let people know that 
there is not one person up here on this dais that would ever talk about defunding the police. Um, I want everybody to know that. We have a lot of respect for the police department. Um, I cannot remember a time, this has been a lot of debate on, on this issue, but a time where we've all said, no, we're not gonna spend that money. So I want the community to understand that we talk to each other, we agree to disagree and respect each other, and this has been a, this has been a big issue for all of us on how, how we see this. The only thing I'm gonna repeat from this afternoon is I think that we've gotten too far down in the weeds. It's starting to feel like a um, power struggle and um, that's unfortunate. We all support programs for youth and drug education and prevention. There are so many programs in this community that are successful and that are um, uh, worth funding I'm happy to have a continued discussion about that, but I really believe, and, and Chief Meidel knows this about me, when, when I agree with the Chief, he knows that, and we've had our back and forth, but I really believe this is his decision, and um, that we've gotten just way, way down, kind of directing something that um, he should be directing. So, Chief, if, you don't want this to pass, then I will vote no on it. But I just want the community to know this is, is not a, uh, an easy decision. We've all really put our heads to this and really tried to come up with some compromises. So that's where I'm at. Any last comments? All right. Prepare to vote. against prepare to vote okay it broke. that looks good oh okay four to three which means it does not have five and so this special budget ordinance goes away brings us to the next <coughs> oh wait do we yeah the next ordinance Ordinance C36234, Public Safety and Judicial Grant Fund, who number one, increased the appropriation by $153,000. A, of the increased appropriation, $150,000 is provided solely for upgrading and, and installing a new target turning system at the firing range. B, of the increased appropriation, $3,000 is provided solely for additional training courses. C, the increased appropriation is funded from the balance in the Public Safety and Judicial Grant Fund unappropriated reserves portion of the state distribution to assist with one-time costs related to law enforcement and criminal justice related legislation. This action arises from the need to update training facilities and equipment deferred from August 22, 2022 agenda. There is no community testimony on this one. Any more council commentary after we debated it earlier today? No. no. All right. Okay. This is the this is the amended one, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, wait. What's the amended one, which is the, can you tell me quickly the amended one? It's the targets and the $3,000, so no carpet and no AV. Yep, yep. So on yours, it is B and D. And D. Why do I have A and C? Hold on. A, a and C is what was removed. That's what yes. we removed. Okay. <clears throat> and where was, um, can I ask a question? Of course. So where, um, Jackie, Jacqueline, mm -hmm. where was, is she okay with the amended version? My, my understanding is they, they, their emphasis was on the, the target turning system. And if, uh, as long as that was included, that they would, they would compromise to that. And they're, that's included in here. It is. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I would say slightly different is that what they want is they want the entire thing, but yes. anything is better yes. than nothing is, yep. is their stance. Okay. So. In, if they had their druthers, they would get they would get all of it. Okay, yeah. and, and I would add yes, that's correct. Um, but they they were the two things that we have included are primary importance to them. So, so I I would just add if we did not approve it, they would not be able to purchase those things. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. Also a special budget ordinance, so it takes five votes. Mm -hmm. uh, prepare to vote. All right, that passed the seven to zero. 
Ordinance C36278, Code Enforcement Fund, number one, decrease the appropriation for a laborer one position by $18,750. Two, add one director of code enforcement and parking services position in the code enforcement department. This action increases the number of director of code enforcement and parking services from 0 to point zero, or point, 0 0.5. Number three, increase the appropriation for director of code enforcement and parking services by $18,750. The appropriation provides budget authority for salary and benefits through the rest of the current fiscal year. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the code enforcement fund. And parking system fund, number one, decrease the appropriation for parking enforcement specialist one position by $18,750. Two, add one director of code enforcement and parking services position in the parking meter revenue department. This action increases the number of director of code enforcement and parking services from zero to 0.5. Number three, increase the appropriation for director of code enforcement and parking services by $18,750. The appropriation provides budget authority for salary and benefits through the rest of the current fiscal year. B, there is no change to the overall, overall appropriation level in the parking system fund. This action arises from the need to create a di director position for code and parking. And there's no uh, community comment. Mr. McDonald. Yes, uh, Steve McDonald, Community and Economic Development Division. Um, <clears throat> so as discussed earlier, this um, utilizes salary savings from both the code enforcement fund and the parking systems fund to create one um, division director position uh, would be the proposal is to combine both code enforcement and parking together and this would fund that director position for this fiscal year. Any questions for Mr. McDonald? That, that's through, yeah. through the end of 23, right? 22. Or tw yeah, and then 22. in so the, the 23 year, budget that we're doing now, we'll, we'll be okay. um, submitting that. Thank you. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. Okay, that passed the seven to zero. Ordinance C36279, continuum of care fund. Number one, increased revenue by $2,687,684. A of the increased revenue, $2,687,684 is provided to the city of Spokane for the youth homelessness demonstration program grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Number two, increase appropriation by $2,687,684. A of the increased appropriation, $2,613,049 was provided solely for contractual services provided by subrecipients that will implement the coordinated community plan for the YHDP. B of the increased appropriation, $74,635 is provided solely for the city's administration of the YHDP. This action arises from the need to adjust the budget for a grant awarded to the city for the youth homelessness demonstration program. All right, there's no community comment requested. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Resolution 2022-83, approving the appointment of Tammy Palmquist as the Director of Development Services Center. All right, there's no community comment, but we will hear from Mr. McDonald. And again, Council, I'm pleased and honored to ask for your approval of two outstanding city employees, wonderful managers, fantastic leaders, and I'm honored to work with them, and I ask for your approval, please. Councilmember Wilkerson. And we are, I'll speak for myself, mm -hmm. I am pleased and honored to support them. They've been fantastic to work with, both of them responsive, and even a little bit fun. So uh, I think they'll be great in their new positions. So welcome. Councilmember Bingle. Yeah, again, for both of them, there's been a couple times where I've, I've come to both and needed some, some real education on some issues. And both have been very generous with their time, very knowledgeable, and have uh, made sure that I understood what I was talking about um, and made me feel much more comfortable in my community engagement or in my decision. And so, yeah, I think both of you are going to do a great job in your position. It's, it's just perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy. <laughs> and thank you for uh, setting the example that we have employees that should be looked at as far as being moved up and promoted. And these were two great choices. So thank yeah. you. Makes it easy for me too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I also just wanted to note, I've been working with both of you for almost seven years and you've always been very easy to work with and you've also uh, walked through some hard valleys at the city at times and you've done it and you've kept your integrity and you've kept your head up and I'm so glad you've emerged in the leadership positions that you are and thank you Mr. McDonald for yeah. promoting them to that. With that, prepare to vote. We're, this is just for Tammy Palmquist yeah. so she gets her moment, mm -hmm. right. her screen. So prepare to vote on Tammy. All right, congratulations, Tammy. And Better next. wait, and we'll put a stamp on your head that said <laughs> passed. <laughs> Resolution 2022-84, approving the appointment of Luis Garcia as the Director of Parking Services and Code Enforcement. All right, again, no uh, public commentary. We've already heard from Mr. McDonald, and we've heard from our members and have their happiness about this. Prepare to vote. Congratulations. Resolution 2022-85, approving the appointment of Jason Nekanicki as the Director of Contracts and Purchasing. All right, uh, there's no public commentary and Jason doesn't currently work for the City of Spokane, <laughs> so he didn't have anyone come up, but Jason, we're really um, excited that you're going to join us. Any council commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. I've known Jason, I was trying to remember, like 15 years um, in his work. And when I had the chance to interview him, I said, you know you are coming into a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. He said, Council Member Wilkerson, I understand it can deal with crisis. So I thought, well, you might be the perfect person uh, for this job. So I personally would highly recommend him and I look forward to working with him. And I believe he will be an excellent asset to the city in this position. All right, prepare to vote. All right, congratulations, Jason. Next. Resolution 2022-86, setting the assessment roll hearing before City Council for December 5, 2022 for the Downtown Parking and Business Improvement Area, Business Improvement District bid and providing notice of the 2023 assessments to business and property owners. All right. There is no commentary. I don't think we have a staff presentation on that. We're just setting the hearing. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. Resolution 2022-87, setting the assessment roll hearing before City Council for December 5, 2022 for the East Sprague Parking and Business Improvement Area Business Improvement District bid and providing notice of the 2023 assessments to business and property owners. Again, no public commentary requested. Any council commentary? Again, just setting the hearing. Prepare to vote. All right, seven to zero. Resolution 2022-89, I'll read it its entirety. A resolution committing the city of Spokane to work with the Washington State Legislature to pursue funding for a new regional law enforcement training center. Whereas the Spokane Police Department's SPD current training center is the epicenter of training for SPD. And whereas the training center hosts two Washington State Basic Law Enforcement Academy ses sessions for Spokane and other regional law enforcement agencies and two to three in service trainings per year. And whereas the training center currently serves as a primary training center for other regional and state law enforcement agencies that may not have the resources or capacity con to conduct updated law enforcement trainings. And whereas the training center continues to provide progressive training and active bystandership for law enforcement, implicit bias, procedural justice, and reality-based training. And whereas SPD hosts outside groups, including citizen police academies and youth school field trips at the training center in order to build relationships with the public. And whereas many aspects of the training center have not been updated for at least 15 years and are in dire need of replacement. And whereas the city of Spokane is best served by regional collaboration, especially regarding public safety. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Spokane commits to collaborate with local representatives of the Washington State Legislature to pursue funding, the funding necessary to update and expand Spokane's regional law enforcement training center that would serve SPD, other regional law enforcement agencies in the entire state of Washington. All right, Councilman Zappone, would you like to? Yeah, so 
this resolution is basically saying that the, the city would pursue asking our state delegation to, ask, to pursue funding in the state legislature. Uh, this arose out of the needs that we're seeing at the training facility. Um, the police have requested funding to replace the carpet, the AV system. They've also said that they need bathrooms replaced and uh, the facility has really been used, in a, in, used a lot. And so we need to make sure um, that we can pursue funding to um, make sure that uh, uh, it is that regional facility. Uh, the, our Spokane police have been using it for their in-service training, but we also use it as a regional training center. And so, um, as the police have pointed out, it's kind of an embarrassment with the carpet and other parts of the building. So this is a resolution and a future pursuing for state funding of it is to really get more funding than what we're able to fund right now and asking the legislature to help fund our police even more to make this a, a great facility for not just Spokane, but for our region. And so we're looking forward to working with the police department, our state legislatures to uh, pursue this funding and make it a regional facility where they're doing a lot of great work, but that can be built on and, and better. Um, and we're hopeful that there's a lot of support. We've talked to the state representative and state representatives who are, are willing to support this, um, but it will depend on what will happen in the state legislature, but we're looking forward to, and we're optimistic about our uh, chances of hopefully uh, getting more funding for the regional f training facility. All right, there's no public comment. Any council commentary? All right, well, great work, council members Zapone mm -hmm. and Kinnear. Moving that forward, prepare to vote. All right, that passes seven to zero. All right, next ordinance. Ordinance C36. 260, vacating portions of Boy Scout Way and Gardner Avenue between Washington Street and Howard Street. First reading held August 22nd, 2022. All right, doesn't look like we have a report from Eldon on this. We have no community comment. We have no assuming Eldon. the. What? We have no Eldon. I know. I'm assuming they've now uh, complied with the conditions that we put on it, so it's ready for a final vote. All those. Oh, prepare to vote. Last ordinance for tonight. Ordinance C36271 relating to the permitted use of forfeiture funds amending sections 8.19.030 and .040 of the Spokane Municipal Code. All right. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it already today, but we did amend this uh, somewhat to make sure that it just lasted for a year with these priorities. Um, and... This is just an update of the existing ordinance that's already has been the law in Spokane for a long time that council and the police department have to agree on how to spend forfeiture funds. But when we got a letter saying that we were in trouble for not being in agreement, then I started authoring this to make it clear on some of the gaps where it was unclear. And this particular one makes it clear uh, a couple of things. One that uh, federal law and federal rules on federal forfeitures are not applicable to state law on state forfeitures. Uh, also that um, the uh, council can raise or lower the amount of money on a particular item as long as a chief of police has approved that item as a crime fighting tool that would be eligible for forfeiture. And then it also, uh, we've heard this discussed uh, make the funds that the department wants for buying drugs and paying confidential informants the highest priority, and then the youth intervention drug education and prevention programs the second highest priority, and would um, uh, make sure those were funded first each year before we spent forfeiture funds on anything else, and we preserve the uh, reserve of $250,000 that the chief needs every year for um, uh, the normal things, and let's see what else. <clears throat> and then I think I already mentioned this, but at the end of, oh, it also would require a quarterly written report um, from the department on how they've been using the money per Councilmember Wilkerson's request that we get that on a regular basis. Um, and 
um, that we would look at this again after 2023 to make sure there are sufficient funds to keep up that. So there is some community comment on this and I believe Jennifer Hyde. Do you hear Jennifer? Let's see Jennifer. Uh, next is Antone Ballone. Okay, go pass. Tracy Blum. Tracy's still here. Let's see Tracy. And then Chief Mino. Welcome back. Thank you, Council President. Good evening, Council President, members of the, the Council, Craig Mile, Chief of Police for the Spokane Police Department. Thank you for giving me just a, a few minutes to talk about my concerns uh, with this ordinance. And in short, the, the concerns we discussed on the previous uh, asset forfeiture ordinance are almost mirror the exact same concerns I would have with this proposal. But I do want to go specifically to, uh, on the copy that I have anyways, it is section 08. 0.19.030 permitted use of funds. <clears throat> Excuse me, under bullet E, the city council may include expenditure forfeiture funds in the annual budget for any purpose that the chief of police has previously requested funding, regardless of whether the chief is currently requesting funding for that purpose. So in addition to all the other discussion points that we had in the prior ordinance, uh, priorities change. And what's a priority uh, this year may be a different priority next year or the year um, uh, several years down the road. So I am concerned that a, me or a different chief may make a request and then they're going to be bound by that even though those priorities may change. And then under bullet F, that states the city's top priorities for spending state authorized forfeiture funds are as follows. The city will annually fund these two priorities equally from state funds and will not expend additional state forfeiture funds if it would reduce the reserve of state for forfeiture funds below 250,000. So as an example, um, if we're going into if we're going to, going to go into, as an example, 2024 with $375,000 remaining, and we know we need $120,000 each year for drug investigations, uh, ideally two to three undercover cards, which is 80 to 120,000 plus training, um, we know that that's going to get us uh, down to below the 250. So even if we were to look at the 375, 375,000, with a 250,000 floor, my concern is, is that we will only be able to take a partial amount of that 120,000 that we currently need for drug investigations. And that may be split in half since the way I'm reading this, it says the priorities will be equally, uh, they will be equally funded as well. So we may not have enough in there to fund both, which means one year we could conceivably have 60,000 for drug investigations, 60,000 for youth intervention or less. And I think it leads to other issues with not having sufficient funds in there. So. Uh, in addition to that, my, my concerns with this are related to all the other talking points. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, again, we, we had a pretty hearty discussion about this during our briefing session, so welcome to go back and, and watch that. But uh, just real quickly, and I touched on the same thing the Chief just brought up uh, during briefing, you know, that is certainly a concern, and I would just take it a little bit further um, and, uh, and argue that, you know, it doesn't define necessarily the chief or, or who or who the chief of police is and so reality is you could take this back to previous chiefs um, you know we've, we've had a a, um, a number of them over the last several years and so um, I, I think there just needs to be sideboards on because it's the current chief who has to oversee the fund it's the current chief who's in charge it's the person in there who's identifying these priorities and the chief just pointed out that priorities do change and the best available science does change and you know, best practices change, things change. And so to open ourselves up to the possibility of funding things that are, you know, potentially seriously out of date or just no longer, you know, real considerations, um, I just don't think is smart. But then also, and again, the chief touched on it, the $250,000 limit and the fact that we are being required to fund these two, two items equally from this fund uh, does, you know, put some problems down the road. Uh, if we are gonna fund some additional trainings, if we're gonna fund the undercover cars that come around every year or two that we have to fund, and anything else that, that might you know, come up that, that is um, you know, certainly a priority. And again, the at-risk youth drug prevention programming, super important, very, very, very important, something that we all, all of us up here, you know, 7 would would support. Uh, the problem is, where is it coming from? Do we have enough in the forfeiture funds? Are we harming that fund? 
Um, again, I, I trust the chief's judgment. I understand where he's coming from. He's the person in charge of watching the fund. Uh, so I would defer to him um, on that. And so I'm just, I'm not gonna support this. But I do think the report, I think the report at the end of this thing is, is spot on. We absolutely should have the report. We should have good data. We should have good metrics. Let's understand, you know, are we, are we seeing uh, improvements. I don't know to the extent that we can truly measure that because state law does change and evolve and things are happening outside of our control. Uh, but to the extent that we can control it, let's get that data and metrics and make sure that things are working appropriately. Um, but uh, so I, I would certainly support requiring a report, but the rest of this uh, at this point in time, I, I just don't support. Any other commentary? Councilor Bingle. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, a lot has been said on this um, and what should happen. Again, I think it, it really just, again, at the end of the day, comes down to, uh, you know, this is this is going to drain this account uh, pretty quickly, in in my opinion. And, um, you know, as, as much as we want to say, you know, historic highs, it's not $360,000 high. I mean, we're not getting uh, that that level of, of revenue from this, um, uh, from this program here, and we certainly don't want to um, have any sort of perception that we have to encourage police to seize more, more assets to be able to fully um, do their job. And so, I think there's there's a good argument against it uh, from a from a financial standpoint, um, from a good governance standpoint, from a moral standpoint. Um, I think we find ourselves in a position where it's just not gonna not gonna end up achieving anything. Uh, either investing in children or uh, 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 finding drug dealers in um, and getting them off the streets. I don't think it's going to, I think this is one where it, it actually removes our ability to do either of them well. Um, so I'm going to be opposing it. Um, I appreciate that there's a sunset on it, um, that it's going to, it at least, uh, you know, will only be there for a year. Um, but uh, But overall, I think this just... It's a it's a bad usage of our of, of our dollars. Any other council commentary? I'm just going to mention a couple things. One, uh, now that I looked at the language that Councilmember Cathcart uh, about the chief of police, as if it could go back to Ann Kirkpatrick, I don't see that. This is written in the present tense. It says the chief of police has previously requested. So uh, it is it's for this chief if this chief, whoever the chief is at the time. Um, and also, I wanted to, I, we're still talking about this fund is gonna get depleted. I just, there's no evidence that that is likely to happen. Uh, the $250,000 buffer that I put in there, that was at the request of the chief when we met with him. He says, please have a buffer in there because what if we have a bad year and then we don't? So that buffer was not my idea. That was the chief's idea. So if people don't like the buffer, uh, that's there. But again, if you add the 120,000 uh, for drug, uh, drug buys and 120,000 for uh, youth drug prevention education, uh, that's $240,000. We've been getting that money uh, regularly. And the only reason we spent money to buy three undercover cars this year is because we had so much money in our account. Uh, so we said, yeah, we got plenty of money in the account so we can do it. And in my uh, judgment, these two things are the most important. And if we have extra money for um, undercover drug cars or other things, uh, then we can use them because we had a good year and we can do that in terms of the fund. But the core things that will address the fentanyl crisis and the overdose crisis and everything else are what's most important. Uh, the department has asked for money in both of those. This just formalizes it and takes a little bit of the guesswork out every year so that if we're doing this at budget season or next year when there's an SBO, we don't spend, you know, I think we probably spent about four hours of debate over different times out it. That's what the intent of this is just to make it super clear and then look at it in a year and make sure the money's there. With that, prepare to vote. All right, that passes four to three. That brings us to first reading of ordinances. <clears throat> Ordinance C36280, updating the duties and responsibilities for the Spokane Human Rights Commission, amending section 4.10.040 of the Spokane Municipal Code 
Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. And there is no requested public testimony on the first reading of ordinances, but we do have some open forum folks. And since we've got here pretty early for once and we don't have too many folks, I think we'll just go through without having a break. Yes. So is Tracy Blum here? I don't, I don't see Tracy. Uh, next is Kim Schmidt and then Antone and then William Hewlings. Hi again, Kim Hi. from the Valley. So we made it into national news again today. Um, just, you know, sitting around watching MSNBC and I hear the word Spokane. And a, a woman from Spokane was interviewed today about um, basically a short version of the story. What had happened was she was approached by two aggressive door knockers who knocked on her door to ask about how she voted in the 2020 election. This happened in Spokane. Glenn Morgan of Washington Voter Research Project was interviewed um, during this clip. He runs a group of about 350 door knockers, <clears throat> some of which, um, this is a statewide program that is run by conservative Republicans. Um, one of the people that is with this group has been flashing a metal badge. Um, some folks in this group make it seem like they are from the Secretary of State's office or the auditor's office. Vicki Dalton and Steve Hobbs uh, were both interviewed during this piece, and they assure people that the Secretary of State's office and the auditor's office would never send representatives from their offices to your door. Now, I speak about this up here as kind of a public service announcement. This happened in Spokane. Um, I also bring this up because there's been a lot of, you know, reports in media and stuff about these things happening all over the country. And I started to actually do a little research into this yesterday, when uh, yesterday morning during his sermon, Matt Shea announced that they are starting Dropbox training to have a group of ballot watchers that are connected to their church. Their training occurs um, September 30th. Um, the actual quote that was stated, um, the reason why they need uh, people to watch the ballot drop boxes is they don't get stuff so so that the drop boxes don't get stuffed with anything that is not of God, end quote. So I just wanted to make you all very aware that this is happening. It's something that I'm going to be spending a lot of time looking into. And you can find both of those clips on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok for the Stronger Together Spokane account. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Anton, do you want to come down? And after Anton is William Hewlings and then Sherry Barnett. Thank, thank you. I'd just like to say, you know, I'm sitting there listening, you know, about the police and the, the council, you know, like the, to defund, you know, and I think that, you know, we are adults, you know, the mayor, and, you know, the police department, and you guys are adults, you know, and there shouldn't be none of that. You know, but because I said and I listened, that's why I didn't say nothing. You know, I, I changed. You know, when you asked me to want to, to say something, you know, that uh, we need to pull out that adult in us, not just the uh, council members, but all the uh, civic groups, the departments. They need to mature rather than you know gossip me. You know, like because that's what I've heard all a lot. Of, a while back about the uh, defunding the police department, you know, like there's uh, the bad guys and the good guys, you know. There is no good guys and there is no bad guys. And if there are bad guys, they're in all of us. They're on the side of the department and they need to mature. We need to have adults in a room. We need to start thinking, you know, about the people, the homeless and, and yeah, the people rather than enemies, you know, like they are our enemies, you know. I just want to say that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Anton, for coming down. Yeah. All right, William. And after William, Sherry Barnett, and then Justin Haller. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. Uh, I live 
resident of downtown Spokane. Um, so lately, I mean, I even seen Councilman Bingle. I've been uh, going to help my friend that's moving out of the beautiful city of, uh, well, she lives in the valley. But she works downtown at the Chase Building for a law firm. And she's moving because of just everything that people come up here and talk about, the homelessness, the crime. So the last couple of days I've been riding, down, riding my bicycle out to the valley, I ride down Pacific through the East Central neighborhood. I ride past unmarked police cars and these, these police officers sit there for 12 hours and they just sit there and watch this camp and I ride past this camp, and it's eye-opening. And I've talked about this several times, all the time. And I'm going to keep on talking about it because it's almost October. There's still a camp. Now they're talking about putting a fence around it, putting lights up. I mean, you've got people putting up illegal building structures. So when it snows, there's going to be people out there in their tents I mean, what are you guys going to do then? I mean, this is just ridiculous, and I wish you guys would do something. Quit playing around. And I, I heard there's going to be a walkthrough Camp Hope Thursday, October 6th at 9.30. I plan on being there, but, I mean, just please do something. I mean, because I'm getting tired of coming up here and I, I, it's sickening what's, what I see when I drive through there. And then also I've, I've heard rumors that Fred Myers might be shutting down. Because if you go over there, <laughs> there's over 90 something shopping carts. Now I've heard that people go shopping at Fred Myers, they can't even get a shopping cart because they're all at Camp Hope. That's, that's a felony, stealing shopping carts. But obviously they're homeless and it's, you know, we don't want to put them in jail for shopping cart theft, but something's got to be done. Thank you. Thank you, William. Sherry Barnett, and then Justin Haller, and then Amber Durkoop. I'm Sherry Barnett, and I live in Spokane. President Beggs, I'm still on the same subject, more or less because we are, when I was a child, this nation was strong. It was good. And I have watched as it decimated its status with God. First, the Bible reading was taken out. I think that was like 1960 or something. Then the Ten Commandments. Then it was made it no fault divorce. Then they made, I don't know, I know homosexuality became legal, then marriage in homosexuality became illegal. Abortion became legal, and abortion is murder. And there is no way that any honest person can look at it any other way. Now we are having Supreme Court justice people persecuted, their homes, People standing around making, I think, threatening them. Same thing with pro-life places. They're being threatened. The people from January 6th that had a peaceful, uh, they're calling it an insurrection, which it wasn't. We are using lies for language so that we can harm people that are not on our team. And this has to stop. I watched while Rodney King, a very famous little crook in LA, but the news media blew it up and blew it up that the police were so mean to him because they had to be, because he was a huge man on PCP and other drugs. And they wound up paying him millions and millions of dollars. And then, he came back and just rammed his car through the 
store windows after his girlfriend. Here's the gist of the whole thing. <clears throat> if we do not honor God, and even if you don't honor God, if you honor those commandments, they are sure rocks. This nation would stand. They are after this nation. They want to destroy this nation because we are hope of freedom and liberty because of the Lord. The same thing was true basically because of George Floyd. He was a crook. And they took a lot of policemen and put them in jail, took them away from their families because they told lies. Sherry? I'm just saying, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming down. Uh, Justin Heller, after Justin, Amber, Dirkoop, and then Dave M. by phone. Oh, here we are again. Justin Haller, District 2, because District 1 was intolerable, and the people who pretended to care about uh, District 1 at the time wouldn't either, either wouldn't get back to me or lied or just give me the okie doke and uh, none of them would walk down Brown at the time, like I asked them to do. They claimed that they walked down other streets, but they, I never saw it. And it's gotten to be a point where now we have fences, and I'd like to find out whether we're renting those fences or we own those fences. Either way, I think it's a waste of resources, and you should allow SPD to do their job and get the people who are sitting there, the help that they need, versus shuffling the problem and oozing it out. And when you allow Camp Dope, and it's Camp Dope, not Camp Hope. Don't, don't fool yourself. There's drugs, there's filth, there's crime, there's rape. It's just a matter of time before that comes in your neighborhood, your neighborhood, your neighborhood. He won't even look at me. He's too busy twittering himself on his phone. Unbelievable. It's just, you guys are, five of you are completely deplorable and allow this to happen and you're in lockstep with the agenda. When it, was, when it was in front of your city hall, you allowed it to happen. And then you shuffled it off like, no, 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 not here. We don't want it here. We don't want it near our business. We don't want it where we work. Then you shuffle it and it's allowed somewhere else. Imagine if it was 100 homeless people in your neighborhood. No, 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 you won't allow that there. In fact, crime was so bad near Manitou Park, somebody moved away from Manitou Park. Imagine that. They wouldn't do anything about crime in their own neighborhood when they could. And I'm sick of hearing from people who come from the valley, who don't even live in Spokane, who have no vested interest, no skin in the game, so to speak, blathering on about Spokane's problems. I live here, I live in Spokane. There was a, a, a shooting less than a block from where I live. Not from where you live, probably not from where you live, probably not from where you live, probably not from where you live. But no, it's okay where I live, but not for you. And I'm sick of the hypocrisy. <clears throat> you know, you, got, you guys, every week you ignore us. Five of you are consistent and constant basis, ignore the, your constituents. People stand up here and you got 40 people standing up against something and 16 people standing for something and, and, and you ignore the 40 and you go with the 16. How is that okay? That's not listening to your public. You work for us. You work for us. Do you get that? Come voting time, most of you people are gonna be out because you don't listen to us. Yeah, look at the time. Yeah, look at the time. Don't pay attention to me, Brian. Thanks, Mr. Haller. Uh, Amber? Dirk Coop. And after Amber is Dave M. by phone, then Matthew Buchanan by phone. Come on down, Amber. All right. So Christine Quinn. OK. Hi, I'm Christine Quinn from West Hills, and there was another article, um, an op-ed Betsy had written, and it was, East Central deserves to determine its own destiny, and so does West Hills. That's what we really want as a community. 
um, our park, Whittier Park. I don't know if anyone's been to it. It's pretty disgraceful and sad. And talking to people, it's been that way for 50 years. Um, for many, many years, everything that was put in there was put in by the neighbors. <coughs> and they took care of the park because the parks department, for whatever reason, never did. Um, and we just seem to be, have been forgotten, completely forgotten. Um, and we don't seem to have anybody helping us or rooting for us or that wants to see revitalization. Um, so I'd like to just ask, we need help and we don't know what to do. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Uh, next is Dave M on the phone. You wanna hit star three, Dave, if you're there? All right, Dave, welcome back to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, City Council, it, it's a shame that some members on the council show no respect and no regard for the mayor, the chief of police, and of course, as we've all witnessed, the general public whom elected the council to do the wishes and wants of the citizens of Spokane. It's been nothing but a disappointment after disappointment from this current city council. I hope the citizens of Spokane are paying attention and will be voting for a change in the council come next election time. Now to the council, I have a couple questions and I would, would like to get an answer somehow. Uh, first question is the mayor and the council have stated that we need to increase our police force by approximately 70 plus officers. How about we get this done? When will this be on the agenda? That is my first question. My second question is, how is the best way to get in touch with any of you council members when we leave messages, we don't get return calls, we email, we rarely get return emails uh, to and get a response from the council? My last issue is I have sent a couple emails to uh, a person who I believe works for the city council but isn't really stating who they work for regarding the uh, water conservation that was passed and the reports and numbers uh, that were used for that. And I'm kind of getting the runaround, uh, not, getting, not getting the answers. I don't know if that's because this person doesn't have the answers. I can give you that person's name. I think you know who it is. Uh, and if they don't have the answers, then who is their boss and, and you know, where can we get those answers? So those are my three questions. How to get a hold of you? When are we gonna get some more cops? And uh, the, the water conservation. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, we don't typically answer questions from open forum We respond to that, but, um, and you, maybe you have emailed me. I, I don't know your last name, so, but if you want to email me, um, tonight, bbegs at spokanecity.org, I'll look for it and answer those questions. Um, all right, next is Matthew Buchanan, also by phone, if you want to hit star three. All right, Matthew, welcome to city council. You have up to three minutes. Hello? Yes, Matthew, is that you? That is me. All right, you have up to three minutes. Hello, and thank you for your time. I am here today to reinforce the uh, East Central Neighborhood voice on all this. We, the East Central Neighborhood, welcome the police and the sheriff to do whatever is necessary to keep us safe, including the removal of Camp Hope. There's been three dead bodies found in the same intersection, all relating to Camp Pope. Two of them were homicides. The other was stated as not natural, which means there's potentially been three murders or homicides in our neighborhood. Now, how is this a sleepy little neighborhood with little to no crime? Mr. Beggs has been asked multiple times. All right. Three times, actually, now, with absolutely no explanation of what he meant. 
Mr. Beggs also said he would address the comments after the last forum. Council President Banks and local media KHQ has worked together to spread misinformation. I've reached out to KHQ regarding this with your response. It has taken a lot for me to come back and speak to you guys. Because the last time I was here, Mr. Beggs was shaking his head at what I was saying and allowing members of Jules Helping Humans to speak over me and I was being hooked and interrupted during my three minutes. Now, I would call that bullyish behavior. It is not making a citizen sound voice. You are elected to be our voice. Council so now that the sheriff is second you to you do your job for the community and not can't vote, you call Mr. Buchanan, bully. there's a point of order. Just a second. Uh, just the personal attacks is inappropriate for council members up here on the dais. Uh, he can communicate with you directly. Excuse me? Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson says the makes the point of order that personal attacks are not appropriate for open forum. You can communicate directly with whoever you have a concern with. So you can continue. Um, okay. I was under the understanding that was for you as council president. My comments were made to Mr. Beggs and only to Mr. Beggs. I know, but yeah, the point is, though, we're still not supposed to do personal attacks on it. You can address your comments to me, but you can speak to me directly another way if you'd like. But continue on. Okay, it sounds like it's your way or no way. You've shown this behavior multiple times, pulling the police precinct without being known. You know, the police aren't city vehicles where you can just put them wherever they are. You know, wherever you want. They're people. And the data... Hello? Yep, we're still here, Mr. Buchanan. Okay, the data that you are, are being given, I would love to see, because that information does not go in front of the data that we are receiving here in the center. Uh, I don't know why you guys are giving the police department such a hard time on a simple $100,000 when you guys approved a $900,000 pilot program that paint crosswalks. All right. Mr. Buchanan, that's the end of your time for tonight, but you can come back next so Monday. You know, have three minutes. Do, do. Okay. All right. Our last, wait, no, we have Nolan Steiner, and then we'll have Amber Durkut. Is Mr. Steiner? Come on up. Welcome. My name is Nolan Steiner and I live in West Hills and I have two goals for my comments to you today. One is to share with you a little perspective of West Hills, the history, and two is to list several asks of you. So try to make this brief on the history of West Hills. I'm not sure if you've heard of us, but I think lately you have. Uh, we're a neighborhood that has been around a long time. My, ho my home was built in 1914. There's not a large population in West Hills, then there's only about 1,700 households with 3,000 people. Um, most of the residents of Spokane drive up Sunset Boulevard and pass through our neighborhood without even knowing about it. The Arboretum is one of the pride and joys of West Hills, much like Manitou Park is to South Hill or Riverfront Park is to downtown. We live in an urban forest. This is West Hills. West Hills carries a significant amount of infrastructure already, and just to restate what that is, um, I-90 goes through West Hills, and at one point there, are, there were homes moved from where I-90 currently is out of West Hills into other sections of West Hills, and they're right next to my house. So the federal interstate system came in and moved those houses, breaking up the neighborhood, and it's not easy for a neighborhood to stay together when that happens, however we did. The railroad also goes through, right through the neighborhood. Two blocks away from me, the, the Federal Railroad Administration has um, put some tracks, or the, the railroad put tracks through the neighborhood, and every day and every night I hear those trains. Spokane Inter International Airport, the FAA, you know, has a, West Hills as a landing zone for planes, and there's increasing traffic, so another, more infrastructure that we carry through West Hills. And it's not just our neighborhood, but we carry a lot of it because the planes get a little closer to the land um, when you get towards my neighborhood. We also have garbage trucks that go up Sunset Highway from, from many parts of the city. Uh, there are some 
um, recovery homes in our neighborhood that try to re re rehabilitate folks and um, get them on their way to healthy living. We also have the Quality Inn likely coming into the neighborhood, which carries more infrastructure. So I just wanted to share with you that those are quite a bit of infrastructure that we're carrying. My asks are, going forward, one, please engage your stakeholders and neighborhoods when you have some issues that come up, such as the shelters in the future. Two, please explain why a publicly funded operations such as Quality Inn, state monies, did not require public engagement at any level. And three, please be advocates for West Hills. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Nolan. All right, Amber, saved you for last. Yeah. Come on up. <laughs> so you could just introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, Hi, and I'm then Amber you can start. Dukup. I live on the South Hill, um, born and raised here. Yeah. Mr. Zapone. I think it's a little um, inappropriate Amber, to text. Actually, okay, so sorry. just address your comment. You can tell your comments. Okay. I just thought the texting was a little odd. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, Amber Durkoop, I live on the South Hill. And um, something that has been on my mind a lot lately today is, ironically, a birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this as um, a proverb is a traditional saying or phrase that expresses a perceived truth. So, you know, proverbs often give practical advice and are based on a shared human experience. Um, I'm, s with that in mind, um, I, I'm not very good at public speaking, apparently. Right. <laughs> okay, so with that in mind, um, I'm thinking about the quality in, in Sunset Hill. Um, I think that it is very heartbreaking for the community, for Spokane. Um, okay, I'm just going to read this. So, okay, I'm stating a realized, perceived, and understood truth that human beings of similar type, interest, personality, character, or other distinctive attributes tend to mutually associate. This is not something made up, it is a shared, learned human experience. And with that in mind, I think giving up what could be an amazing and iconic revitalization project at the Quality Inn to the Catholic Charities is heart-wrenching, regretful, I believe a bit inappropriate, the whole process of how everything went down, and birds of a feather do flock together. The said use for the Quality Inn is to give way to vetted transitional housing for individuals living at Camp Hope. In my opinion, it is 100% inevitable that this plan will devalue the West Hills, its neighborhood, its morale, our community, and Spokane's overall credibility. I live on the South Hill. I come down, that is my entrance to get onto the freeway on the daily, right past Camp Hope. And I come home in the evening, and there are people tweaking out all over the place where the new or new-ish uh, car washing station is, and they have recently sold because they are tired of cleaning up human excrement every morning, and they can't sustain a business like that. It's affecting, like the gentleman on the phone said, it's affecting the neighborhood in a very adverse way, and it's extremely sad, and I do want a resolution, but I just don't think this is the reality of how it's going to happen. And, you know, my friend, she lives right there on 5th, right across from the school. Her and her husband were just talking about selling their mm -hmm. home. Your time is up for tonight, but you can come back. And her fences were stolen. Yeah. It's just, it's awful. Thanks for coming down. All right. That brings us to the end of Open Forum. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your work. Thanks, Council staff. President, yeah. can I have a point of personal privilege real quick? Yes. Um, being up here is is tough. You know, we we take a lot of a lot of criticism, and rightfully so for all of us. We all there's plenty to criticize for, but uh, I just wanted to say, I mean, I appreciate all of you, even if we don't agree, and we we mostly don't agree on some big issues. But I appreciate the drive uh, from everybody up here to to want to make your city better. So, all right. yeah. Thank you, Councilmember Bingle. If you're trying to flatter us, it worked. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, beware the big package coming later. Yeah, no. We'll see everyone next Monday evening. Uh, take care of yourself, and you can take care of somebody else. We're adjourned. Thanks.